Hello, everybody. My name is Marcus Gorman. I'm a programmer here at the Seattle International Film Festival, and uh, welcome to uh, world building through production design. But we might talk about more than production design. Um, but please welcome our panelists. I'll go in alphabetical order. So we have Tucker Audley and Albert Bernie from Strawberry Mansion. Say hello. Hello. Thanks hello. for having me. We have Wes Hurley for Potato Dreams of America. Say hi, Wes. Hey, thanks for having me. Awesome. And then uh, we have Yuli Gerbazi with the Pink Cloud. Say hello. Hello. And then we have Anna Katz with the dog who wouldn't be quiet. Hi, hello. <laughs> and then finally, Christopher Winterbauer, whose film is Worm. Say hello. Hello, everyone. Cool. Um, so we're here to talk about how we can build really heightened or different or strange cinematic worlds without a blockbuster budget. Uh, before we get to that, um, um, can each of you like introduce your film and give us like a really quick log line of the film? You can start in whatever order you want. Uh, I guess we'll go in the same order as the alphabet. So my name is Tucker and Albert. With Albert, we made a movie called Strawberry Mansion. It's a movie about, um, takes place in a world where the government records and taxes dreams. And uh, it follows a, a dream auditor as he, as he uh, enters the home of, um, of an older lady who hasn't paid her, her taxes on her dreams in, in many years. And he, and he kind of gets swept up in her world and her dreams. And uh, adventure ensues. And then up next would be Wes Hurley. Hi, uh, my film is Potato Dreams of America, and it is an autobiographical dark comedy um, about my growing up gay in the USSR, right? As USSR was disintegrating and then uh, coming over to Seattle with my mom who became mail order bride. And up next is Yuli. Uh, so my film is The Pink Cloud. Uh, the Pink Cloud is about a couple that had just met, but suddenly they have to stay together in an apartment for many years because of a pink and mysterious deadly cow cloud that appears in the sky. Up next is Anna Katz. Yes, I'm not very good at building log lines, but because I, I don't know uh, my film uh, uh, <laughs> topic till now. Uh, well, I think it's about a man who tries to survive in a very complicated world. Uh, and adaptation is the most important, maybe, role in my film. And I shot it here in Argentina. And then fr finally, Christopher Winterbauer. Yes. Uh... Your guys' movies all sound amazing, by the way. Everybody should watch them. Uh, but my film is called Worm. Uh, it's about a world where kids have to wear electronic monitoring collars. And you pop your collar when you have your first sexual experience, first kiss, whatever that might be. And it's about a boy who realizes very late that, oh, he's fallen behind and has not popped his collar in time. Uh, and it's a little retro futuristic weird movie about kissing so <laughs> that's what i did that's fantastic uh thank you all so much for being here um anybody can chime in whenever they want this is a conversation this isn't like a lecture um and also uh those of you at home you can uh chime in and you can uh ask them questions through our q a portal at the bottom and i'm also happy to call on people uh but let's start off pretty broadly um what was a a challenging aspect or detail um for building these incredible cinematic worlds uh, i can start uh for me one big challenge from the beginning was thinking about the vfx because we had to have the pink cloud on the window it was very important it's the title of the film and in my short films, I have never uh, worked with VFX before. So it was a long journey uh, learning and, and working with VFX. Me and the uh, DP, Bruno Polidoro, who is great. Uh, we knew that we wanted the cloud to be seductive and beautiful and like a cloud that 
it doesn't sound like it doesn't look dangerous but it is but you see with the passage of time that the cloud really tortures the, the characters um so and of course in my first storyboard i had a lot of clouds and then uh, our budget was very small so we had to cut and cut and cut and see in which moment we really needed that that cloud to be on the window and of course with the we had always the pink light, so we had the presence of the cloud with the light. So if there was, if the living room was pink, uh, we didn't have a cloud on the window, we didn't have the VFX, but with the pink uh, light, we knew that the presence of the, color, of the cloud was there. And yes, um, I was doing some uh, research on, on the pink cloud and your original draft was 160 pages, is that right? Yes. Yes, it was very long, so I had to cut the script a lot, and then uh, cut the clouds. So yeah, it's a lot of cutting, but I'm I'm, I'm happy with the result, <laughs> even with many cutting. And what's really cool about the pink cloud is that, except for a couple scenes at the top and things we see through their televisions and through their iPads, it all takes place in one apartment, and it never feels claustrophobic. Um, how did you design the film to get around feeling claustrophobic or feeling very stage bound? Yes, one rule that uh, I decided that we were going to have was all the supporting characters, we just see them through the screens. And the news and everything that's going uh, out of the apartment, everything in the world, we just see like through the news, but uh, through the eyes of the main characters. So we see the world through the television, through the screens, cell phones and computers. Uh, and the space that we really see with our eyes is uh, the apartment. And th that was very important to, uh, so we could feel the confinement, but at the same time, we were afraid that we want to talk about boredom, but we don't want our viewers to get bored. So it was very important to also have this uh, variety of lights, of uh, settings. Like I think we explored every angle of the apartment that we could, and uh, but also like playing with images uh, when she puts sand on the floor for a moment or like where is she oh no she's in she's in the apartment but she put sand on the floor uh so they put the green light because they want to, to pretend they are they are in a party uh, she puts uh, blue light in her lamp uh, besides her bed so she can have some blue light in, in her bedroom so yes it was I think we, we wanted to explore many things as much as we could inside the apartment and inside our budget so that it wouldn't be visually boring. And I think uh, we have a lot of variety in the end. Uh, well, speaking of pink and like going the opposite, um, Team Strawberry Mansion, um, it, it takes place mostly um, in a mansion outside of it and inside the lead character's brain, but it starts with him in, inside of his dream. It's very Pepto-Bismol pink dream world. And I'm really curious about how you constructed this entire world. I mean, I, I was writing down notes of all the things I'm shocked that people can can do without a studio budget. You know, all the stop motion, the, uh, the skeletons and caterpillars and meteors saxophone playing frog waiter um mouse sailors blue demons and these characters are also like played by you guys at, at some point i know one of you is just inside the frog costume how did you pull out this incredible like sci-fi world yeah i i think we just you know uh we were inspired by these you know big movies that had tons of sets and characters and i don't think anyone told us like we couldn't do that so we just like we just wrote a bunch of characters in all these places and kind of figured it out as we were getting closer to production, like, okay, which things can we, what masks can we make out of paper mache? Which masks do we need to hire professional mask makers? You know, which sets can we build with abandoned trash we find? Which sets we need to have a little bit higher production value? You know, it's just like, let's just throw it all together and, you know, kind of embrace that we're a lower budget movie, but use that to our advantage. Like, if we are pretending that we're not a low budget movie and we're just like throwing it all together and having fun and taking you on this journey, you know, hopefully at some point you just kind of like come along on the journey with us, you know, uh, and you know, it's okay that it doesn't look as like polished as, as like a, you know, huge blockbuster. It, it, it that's part of the charm is that you can feel the, 
the filmmakers feel all the artists that made it in in all of the little details and the the handmade aspect of it yeah and i'll just add i think we were trying to find a balance so we, we wanted to do as much practical effects and practical um props and 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 um uh, cost uh mask as we as as possible just to sort of make the world feel real um just right away without any uh, digital effects but we did use we, we did mix special effects in in post and, and sort of come up with a middle ground of like it, it some of the stuff looks real and some of the stuff looks computer generated and you and and sometimes it's not what it appears to be and like we had we hadn't really worked with special effects either um before this and just trying to find a nice balance of um of of padding out the, the the practical effects with something that felt like you know adding splashes in the water after the fact uh you mentioned the caterpillar which we did a stop motion caterpillar but we added some like you know digital special effects uh of the splashing water that sort of just combining the two techniques created some new flavor that i think confuses people and, and surprises people um so i think just yeah like like albert was saying just try to put together a lot of pieces that aren't necessarily don't go together all the time and hopefully that ends in, in something new and interesting to look at very cool um I, I really enjoy the um the dream auditor helmet it kind of feels like a very gland up trash can in the best way possible it feels this wonderful fringe aspect and that actually ties into the dog who wouldn't be quiet um as the film goes along and this guy is going through relationships and all these odd jobs a uh, sort of apocalypse starts to happen. People start collapsing, and then in the in um, when we get about an hour in, um, a, a pandemic has hit, and people can only can't go above four feet um, um, in the air unless they want to die or, or 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 catch this disease. And so you've created these incredible bubbles, these astronaut bubbles that people wear that look like a CPAP machine or a breathing machine. And I love how down down to earth they feel uh I, um what went into designing uh this sort of apocalyptic idea yes uh i i think you know it's really strange because when when i was writing the, the i i i had been a lot of years imagining this this movie and when i began with this all of all of the team uh, called the, the those scenes, the, the science fiction scenes, they call it like that. And after with the pandemic, when we the, we finished the film was like, like, like a neo realistic, like a Italian neo realistic film in a way because it was extremely close. So the, 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 the science fiction scenes become really I don't know, maybe I, I, I've been receiving a lot of pictures from my friends. Look at that, this is, the, the, this is very similar. This is exactly like your helmet. And that was very funny because I understood that genres are always a, a real uh, invention, you know, that we try to, to, to use just to communicate to each other. Uh, but I don't know. I, I in my case, I, I I liked the idea to build something, to build an object that could uh, be used by some people, but other people can't afford that object. So it it could be a little difference, but determinate if you survive or not. So now in the pandemic, it's really realistic. It's something that changed a lot in my mind because of the, the reality, uh, not in me. <laughs> so uh, yes, I, I still cannot believe that part. And I feel that maybe, well, well, um, on the other hand, in my film, it's because of a meteorite. So I 
finger crossed because I always think that no, please, Mister, it's no. Uh, but yes, I, I I don't know. I think that in in my case, uh, the challenge, the main challenge, was um, to to build a very emotional film uh, because that was the 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 main impression I had. And I feel that it's always too much information living in this world, uh, too much, too much information, TV shows and advertisements and okay, well, net and, and social nets and everything is there. So I was trying to, to go to the past in a way to communicate, but in a different way to the audience. So my my I tried to work on the on the childhood or, or on the on other type of expression to go direct to the audience. This is a, a a very difficult path and I try to work on that all the time. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah, what's really special about uh, your film, which is in this gorgeous black and white and you shot it over a few years and it's all very cohesive and fascinating, and very emotional, is that all the all, all your practical effects are, are very practical, uh, so to speak. They, they are emotional, they are grounded, and they really get to the point of the characters, which brings me over to uh, Christopher Winterbauer for Worm, um, um, designing another sort of analog, sort of lo-fi, sci-fi kind of world that looks like our own, but isn't quite. Um, I'm sure there is some um, special effects that were not practical, but otherwise, this feels like a lived-in world um, that you didn't break the bank to create. Um, what what brought you to to this? Um, was it entirely budgetary, or did you really want to build this extremely analog world from the get go? Uh, well, it was it was budgetary way back. So it started out. Worm started as a short film. It was my thesis film in film school, um, and I didn't have any money. And actually, Kentucker's site No Budge is something that. Uh, I've long been watching everything that he programs. Kentucker programmed one of my first short films years ago, and it's amazing. And if you guys don't support No Budge, go to nobudge.com and check it out. Become a nobody. I still have my card on my fridge. Um, proud Patreon supporter. But anyway, so I loved, I loved the spirit of like, you're just gonna go make a movie. Like obviously what they did with Strawberry Mansion is like so inspiring. And Silvio also before that and everything. So when I made Worm the short, we didn't have any money. I wanted to do these weird collars. And so retro futurism lo-fi became the aesthetic. Um, and then that made the world somewhat believable um, because people just were like, oh, this isn't the future. It's just not our world. It's just a different world that doesn't exist. And we can just go enjoy that world for 15 minutes. And then when we did the feature, it just made sense to continue that way. But the problem is when you put kids in these collars, they're like yanking at them constantly. So they would break all the time. Uh, we'd like super glue them together constantly. They're like ripping them off their necks. We couldn't get them to pop when they kissed. It was like a nightmare. <laughs> um, so never do what I did on this movie because we're like fighting child labor laws to like try to finish the shoot, you know, each day. And it's like 115 degrees in LA in the valley in the summer. And these kids are sweating and the collars are like melting off of their necks. And actually the only VFX we have in the whole film our screen replacements for the TVs when, you know, a couple scenes where there's like a dinosaur on the TV and then wire paint outs because we, the only way we could get the collar to pop is if we had somebody on like one end of the couch with a popsicle stick and a wire and somebody on the other end. And the minute the kids lips touched, they would just yank. And it, I was so nervous. They were going to like behead one of the children, like during the shoot as they were doing it. Uh, so no, it was all very lo-fi, very practical. It was very stressful, but very fun. Um, and, and the thing is like, it seems cheap until you have to make 15 of these calls. Like, you know what I mean? You need a scene with a bunch of them. Like in the short, we only saw like four kids. So it was, it was, and I was like, oh, this is gonna be so cheap for the feature. And then the guy's like sweating, painting like 14 of these things in the hot sun as we're trying to get it done. But yeah, I, I like retro futurism and, and, you know, alternate reality futurism as a style, because I find that like 
a lot of big budget sci-fi that comes out right now, you see it and it kind of instantly feels dated, uh, but not in a way that's fun, not in like the way that I think so many of the films in this um, block have done successfully where it, it, it has a hint of nostalgia to it. Instead, it feels dated in the way that like walking into a circuit city would feel dated or something. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that answers the question, but it was all practical and it was all very messy is what it comes down to uh, when we did it in, in Worm. Yeah, and it, um, Worm builds this really gorgeous universe, and it, it creates a sense of absurdity. Um, little signs in the corner. I, I wrote down things I liked. Um, I like that he has a, a ribbon for eighth place. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, every reference to the the impending internet. The internet, it's here. Um, uh, um, find us on the internet. Welcome, we're closed. And I like the city was just called City. The school was just yeah. called City Secondary School. These all um, help heighten everything. Um, there's sort of a camp element to it, even though the there's a lot of um, you know there's a lot of sadness to the movie that I really love. Um, and you did a good job of kind of finding this weird '80s '90s vibe. Um, another film that has a really incredible '90s vibe is Potato Dreams of America. Um, which is which is Wes's film. So the second half of the film is shot uh, on location in Seattle for the most part, but the first half is set in Russia, and you took a very interesting approach to how to shoot Russia. How did you shoot Russia and where? So yeah, we had to. Um, half of the film is, is set in the Soviet Russia in the eighties and the second half in Seattle in the 90s. So we, uh, on a tiny budget, that was a huge challenge. Um, for Russia, what we did, we uh, found an old, because Seattle didn't have a sound stage, so we found this old um, Staples building <laughs> that was empty and took, took, took it over basically and um, built sets there, which was a lot of fun. And um, my amazing production designer, Kristen Bonnelly, um, and I had a lot of meetings and we basically wanted to really create a very heightened kind of theatrical world that feels like a movie that a little boy would make uh, in his mind. Um, so we really embraced the sort of the flatness of the sets. And, and um, I was, I'm really inspired, my background is in painting, I was really inspired by Baroque paintings and how things sort of dissolve into darkness or emerge from the darkness. So um, a lot of the visuals in the film are this kind of Baroque painting-like tableaus of scenes just taking place in a very flat way. Um, so I guess the biggest challenge for us was budget because it is like two different periods um, and on a tiny budget, it's hard to do. The second, um, like more conceptual challenge for me was that I, I really want wanted the audience to feel a sense of wonder and happiness and discovery as you go from Russia to America. But what I realized as we were, you know, um, talking about our sets and color palettes is Russia, at least Russian interiors, they tend to be really garish and vibrant and, you know, lots of crystal and fake gold and reds and bright colors, kind of um, fun in a trashy way, whereas uh, Seattle in the 90s is very bland <laughs> in some ways, you know, that was like the time of white walls, everything's kind of, you know, late 90s, a lot of kind of boring colors. And so we had to really carefully curate how we do both Russia and the States to heighten this effect. Because for me, you know, coming, it's my personal story. For me, that feeling of excitement coming to the States is obvious, but for somebody who's only um, getting their emotional um, impression of the two countries from visuals, it may not read if they're in a really fun, kind of uh, trashy, colorful world and then go into a much more subdued world. Um, so yeah, we made Russia kind of, we tried to make it drab with lighting, um, with how we curated the sets and then um, but also by opening the world up in America. So as soon as we come to America, everything is more open. There's exterior shots that are actually exterior um, as opposed to being on set. Um, 
it's not flat anymore. So there's a sense of freedom that I tried to sort of subconsciously or consciously um, put people to absorb as they watch. And we have a question from the audience, and this is for everybody. Uh, I'm curious about people's sources of inspiration, uh, films or otherwise, paintings, music, graphic design, anything. Well, for Worm, we did uh, a couple of Spike Jones, like early Spike Jones movies and music videos. The short film, I'm Here, was a big influence. If you guys haven't seen it, it's pretty fun. It's about robots slowly falling apart in Los Angeles. Um, and then uh, Vaporwave, uh, which is the best, worst aesthetic that the internet, I think, has ever produced. If you guys want a rabbit hole on that, it's basically like early Macintosh clip art mashed up with neon colors. And that was a big aesthetic and influence, you know, as we made the movie. Not a lot of like high art in ours, uh, not a lot of Baroque paintings. We're, I'm pretty low class uh, in, in making our movie but um and then like early computers they tried to make them look like people they gave them like weird colors and skin tones like to try to make them look friendly and that's like david cronenberg stuff was definitely an influence uh in that way well as much as you can do with children around um and then uh just like the, the humor in the in the signage and whatnot like i just love absurd signs and and they show up in reality and like i just have always like when I was little, I really thought Adult Swim meant something sexual because I was like everything else, like adult bookstore, adult swim. So I was like, that's when the adults like go swim naked. Like that's what it must be. So like we wanted the adult swim sign to have like and you know, he's holding his shorts up as if they're off, because that's what happens during adult swim. So it was a lot of like what's a child's perspective on, you know, sexuality in the world and whatnot. And uh those were our influences. Anybody else have um, some very direct influences? I can always call them out, but those would just be guesses on my account. Uh, for the script, uh, uh, two important references were The Exterminating Angel by Brinwell and uh, The Play No Exit by Sartre. And after when we when we had the crew, when I was talking with the DP and their director, uh, I used it Melancholia by Lars von Trier as a reference because I was like, it's more this kind of sci fi that is not actually a sci fi. It's not, let's not go to the typical sci fi with that, I don't know, green and white and black colors and futuristic. So, yeah, so I would say Melancholia, Exterminating Angel, and No Exit. A, uh, well, a general uh, inspiration was um, there's there's all the you know our movie has all these VHS tapes uh, that dreams are recorded on. There's just like a whole room filled with VHS tapes, and uh, a huge inspiration was just like going into video stores as a kid, you know, and seeing like the wall of tapes and all the covers, and specifically like the fantasy and horror covers, which were just so filled with images and you know things that scared you and intrigued you, and uh, I think just like trying to make a movie that like a, my 12 year old self would have picked up from the shelf and just be like been intrigued by you know but like just the idea of video stores and being this like sacred special place where you could you know enter all these different worlds and different people's visions um was a huge inspiration and still like that idea like i can still feel that like excitement you know and it still is is an inspiration yeah, picking the movie was more fun than watching the movie a lot of the time, I felt like. It was like, yeah. there was there was like the three hours in Blockbuster before actually watching the movie. It was really yeah, exciting. and yeah, half the time, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, you built up this idea in your head of what this movie is, and you put it on, and like in the first five minutes, you're like, I've made a mistake. Like, this is, this is not the movie that I thought it was, and I should have picked that other box that, you know, maybe the box didn't look quite as cool as this box, but it was probably a better movie. Yep, all the time. And you can't go back, you know. No, you can't. You gotta just run it out. You gotta finish it, and then and there's the, there's always the ones you want to walk by, but you can't get caught walking by because it's it's adult or sexual or some in some way. It's a big theme, obviously, in my work. But there was always those, <laughs> you know, you know, and yeah, it was always fun in the horror sections. Yeah. 
Uh, Anna, how about you? Um, were there any like very direct inspirations for the dog who wouldn't be quiet? Uh, literature, film, anything? It's funny because here it's a dog, and <laughs> can you hear it? <laughs> right now, it's my. I'm firing. <laughs> it, it, he's very inspiring now. Uh, no, well, I, I think my, in this film, this is my sixth film and all of, I think is, it is very different the way I imagine each film. And in this case, I think I worked with some very concrete images from childhood. For example, when you, maybe a drawing, the drawings you make, when you need to express something when you are a child and you and after maybe an adult comes and say says what you tried to say or try to identify some impressions or feelings in the in the drawing of a child i don't know uh, i i try to work with very pure images coming from from the so I don't know how to say it, but now my 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 intention was um, develop the 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 pure uh, moving uh, feeling that comes after the culture uh, building of an image that maybe sounds very strange, but if you see the film, it's not so strange and. Is what I tried to to do because what I really wanted to to work is the idea of those men um, in society in our society, those men who who the society uh, try to well to say to refuse or to reject uh, because they are not so functional, um, th those types of men who society say are passive or, or no proactive, you say, and maybe uh, is the man who can take care of people and take care of plants and there is a special uh, type, type of men uh, that I feel are very important for 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 a transformation, and there are a lot. Of, there are a lot. Maybe you are like that, and there are a lot of those men. Uh, and I really wanted to work with the 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 beginning of of life of all these men. So I don't know. Maybe in this case, uh, I I didn't work with other films or maybe paint. I, I read a lot. I, I love literature, but it wasn't so direct because I was trying to go to my past, maybe. Absolutely. Um, I, I know we're building this around like production and design, um, but we have a question from our audience and what's um, more, not what's not, not Actors are very important as well. And this is a question for both Wes and Christopher. Uh, how did you find your leads? They're all amazing and um, they really wanted to know what's next with them, uh, how you found them and how they really fit into these um, heightened worlds. Uh, for me, um, it started, the film kind of started with casting. I, I've been a huge fan of um, actress Mariah C. Kaminsky, who was a local Seattle actress at the time. And I I wrote the script for her because I just felt like it's an interesting story and she could really pull it off uh, playing my mom. Um, so I wrote the script basically for like inspired by her. And then, you know, it took me years to raise the money to make it. Uh, by that time, I um, haven't raised all the money, but decided to start casting the kid um, to play Little Potato. And I thought it would take forever because I never worked with child actors before. I thought, oh my God, this is gonna be awful. I'll never find a good kid actor. <laughs> and I started auditioning kids and they were so good. And then one of them in particular, Hirsch, 
who we ended up casting Hirsch Powers, he was just incredible. And it was kind of uh, a kick in the butt for me to really finish raising the money for the film. I was like, I can't afford to not make it with him. Like, I need to make it with him while he's still a little kid <laughs> before he grows up. Um, so those were first people cast. And then um, most of my cast is locally from Seattle. I worked with many of the same people before. Um, um, I prefer not to audition. I usually write roles specifically for actors, but because this is my life story, I didn't have that luxury. They were based on real people. So I did audition a few and really had an amazing experience uh, working with Tyler Bocock as another um, young Seattle actor, Sarah Barbieri, who plays Russian Lena. It was really um, beautiful, mesmerizing actor. Um, and then we did cast, we got a casting agent in New York to get a couple of name actors. And um, Leah Delaria was always my dream choice to play um, my grandma. And she is just so fun to work with. And I'm so glad she said yes. And then Laria, uh, we thought would be a really interesting choice because he's kind of known to be this iconic all-American father figure from the Wonder Years. And um, I just thought it would be really fun to see that all-American father figure idea kind of twisted uh, at the end. And yeah, but mostly Seattle cast. And I, I just, I love our community here in Seattle. And there's so many great actors. I, you really don't have to go outside to find um, a great cast. We're very lucky. And uh, Christopher, how about you? How, how was it casting the uh, the great special effect that is Theo? Yeah, Theo is amazing, right? Uh, he, so uh, when we did the Worm short, we had a different lead, uh, Reed Miller, who's great, he was great in the short. But by the time we were shooting the feature, I think he had just turned 19. So he was a little too old for the role. Um, Azure Brandy, who plays Marcella, the sister, who I, is like, the closest thing to a reincarnation of Shelley Duvall that I think we've like ever had um, is amazing. She came along from the short to the feature, but that we were kind of replacing all the other roles because everyone had grown up a little bit. And we did a really long casting search for Theo you know, in LA, um, worked with a really wonderful casting director, um, Wendy, who just was tireless. And we brought in so many kids and just, I gotta be honest, boys around 12, 13, 14, we don't understand emotions in the way that young women do. We would have these young actresses come in. They're so poised. They would crush these scenes, like make me cry. And the boys come in and there's, like, I don't remember the lines. I don't know what I'm doing. And they were all so cute. And, but then Theo came in and he was in this movie called Little Men um, that was really good. And it was really understated. And he came in and then I kind of looked at our producer, Helen, and she was like, he kind of looks like Azure. And so we brought him in together, actually. And that's when they read together, I was like, oh, I can believe them as, as twins. And we cast him five days before we started shooting. So we were like down to the wire and the financier was like about to light their hair on fire. Um, and then what saved us was we only had seven hours of shooting. I mean, West, I'm sure you dealt with this with like child labor laws, but we were so tight. We didn't have a lot of days and we were just so tight on shooting. And Theo only needed, it was like, hey, we got three takes on this, you know, no pressure. Uh, let's see what you got. And he was amazing. He was, he's really mature for his age. I would try to like j crack jokes to make him laugh. And he was like, you're too old for this, man. He was just so wise beyond his years compared to me. Um, and I think, you know, I have a pretty, my style I think is pretty repressed and mannered. And he, I think he brought depth to the character that, um, it was needed. I think he saved the movie in a lot of ways. Um, so Theo, if you're out there. And I don't know what Theo's doing right now. He's in high school. He's a senior. Hopefully he's living his life. Azure is, uh, she's at NYU. She just finished her freshman year in, in acting school. She's amazing. Lulu Wilson uh, played Izzy. She's great. She's like acting in everything. She's taking over the world, um, you know. So uh, all, these, all these young folks, I'm going to be asking them for work in no time, I'm sure. We have a question from the audience. What comes first, the story or the world? 
it's a chicken or the egg situation. Whoever wants to start with this answer, by all means, go for it. Otherwise, I'll call on you like a third grade teacher. Gosh, I guess I'll, I'll go because I don't want to be caught on. Uh, but um, I wanted to see him doing the teacher character. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Marcus, you caught on me. Um, I, I guess, yeah, for, for this one, it was like the, I don't know, they, they kind of both go together, I'd say. You know, it's like you start to, we start to piece together the story about this house in the middle of the countryside filled with VHS tapes. And that's like, that's the beginning of the story. But then also that's the beginning of the world because there's there's this the setting and the where it's going to take place. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know which came first. But I think they kind of just build each other. I, I think... Personally, when I'm coming up with the the story, the images play such a huge role in that and the, the world that the characters are in. So it's hard to separate them, you know? Um, yeah, that's that's my bad answer. No, it's a great answer. Uh, how about your co-director? Any, any any insight on that? Uh, no, in, in I, uh, I, I wanted to tell that the, the main actor of my film is my brother. So it's another case of family <laughs> cast, and uh, he's he's actually he's not an actor, and I found very special to work with him, and he he did it in incredible great, and <laughs> that's I met, that's that's because I think he was part of the world. I I was imagining for the film because of the story. So so I think it's true. It's they go together. The world and the and the and the story are part of a universe that you are seeing. And maybe it's a tone that universe. Maybe it's only a tone. A, 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 maybe in, in my case was like like that feeling of concrete life, concrete life guided me um, in the whole process. So yes, I think it's, it's part of the same thing in some films, of course, because when we talk about films, we talk about, I don't know, like the, the entire world, which is a huge thing. Uh, Yuli, um, and kind of the same question for you. Uh, the story, uh, which comes first, the story or the world? Um, the pink cloud is very cool because the the, the choice of uh, the color for the cloud is very intentional. You want to tell a story about how society uh, affects women and controls women. So I want to know more about that. Yeah, so for me, uh, I wanted from the start to do a film about this couple in this weird situation when they were forced to be together. Uh, and so I thought, what uh, will make them stay like that? And I didn't want to be something realistic. Uh, so when the concept of this pink cloud came to me, I really liked it. And, and I started then to imagine the story uh, being developed inside that world, that that pink cloud world. So I had these rules uh, that were going to stay inside the apartment and then the, the, the look of the cloud and the color of the cloud were, were important to see how it affects mainly the female character, Giovanna. So I think in this project, the world, the concept of the pink cloud and what you can't do in the pink cloud, you can't even open your windows and for some reason, the cloud kills humans, but it doesn't kill animals. And you see that right from the beginning in the first scene, the first sequence. So in that situation, I think the rules of the world came right in the beginning. And then I was developing these stories and seeing how the characters react to this world. And it was very important that they reacted in different ways to the cloud. Uh, Giovanna's reaction and Iago's reaction are very different from each other and that makes conflict between them and it makes the story keeps uh, going on and getting worse and worse and more difficult. So yeah, in, in this case, the, the world was very important. <laughs> almost the pink cloud is almost the, the third character. 
Absolutely. Um, and I guess the question's a little different for Wes, uh, because um, this is this is a version of your life. So I guess I can turn that question into when did you know you wanted to tell a story about your life through cinema? Uh, for me, that happened. I mean, it's kind of in the film in the sense that um, when I was living through some traumatic things in my childhood, I would just imagine that I was making a movie and this was a movie instead. Um, so in a way, making this movie is kind of coming full circle. And, um, but also in, um, I forget what year it was, when Sochi Olympics happened, I was asked to write about uh, sort of a gay Russian perspective on Sochi Olympics and whether it warrants a boycott against Russia and all that stuff. And I wrote an article and it went viral and I um, got just a lot of response from people um, making me realize that there's like no voices of gay Russian experience in the States really or anywhere. There's not a lot. Um, so I just felt like I had to tell the story, especially since my story is very it has a good ending <laughs> and my mom is an amazing person and makes for an amazing character who might inspire um you know young lgbt kids to not lose hope uh, absolutely um and um uh, Potato Dreams of America has some very great musical sequences. Um, you, you shot in, um, on the triple door stage, I noticed, uh, a very, um, a, a, it's a tango, but it's actually about domestic abuse. Um, and then later you have a, a performance right when it transitions from Russia to America. But the thing that really combines all five of your films are these incredible scores and incredible soundscapes that I'm not going to say do a lot of heavy lifting, but they really do a great job setting the tone for these worlds. And I don't know if any of you want to talk about um, your soundtracks, your scores, your soundscapes. I can uh, start with um, uh, Team Strawberry Mansion because the score in this is just incredible. I want to know how this came about and what you want to say with your communication with your composers with in read the film yeah i'll start with saying the sound design is very essential yeah in terms of the, the world building and, and creating an atmosphere um i i think I, i'm always sort of uh tuned into a movie that takes me away through sound um with our movie we got yeah and our score is, is so essential as well our composer dan deacon was um was somebody who I think understood our movie better than we did almost. And I, I was able to just kind of lead, lead, hit every emotional beat and hit every sort of uh, inflection point um, with this, um, you know, co combination of, of, of epic and bombastic and, and also very sweet and, and poetic score that sort of just undulates throughout the film. Sometimes just knocks you knocks you out. Sometimes it just sort of like lulls you into this romance. So, yeah. So and we go so many different places in our film in terms of uh, it's 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 a dreamscape where there's one minute you're on a ship, one minute you're in this confined pink room, kind of back and forth. So the score really had to to lead you through all the the sudden changes. Um, Albert, you got anything to add to that? Well, yeah. Just like you know, it's almost like when we're editing it if we can just get a scene to be at like 50 percent or like 60 percent it's like okay we're gonna give it to dan and he's gonna get it to 100 percent. you know like he would put the score on there and all of a sudden a scene that we were so tired of watching we had seen it a hundred times editing it would be new and i would like feel a whole new feeling and like get emotional you know like he would add some violins and it would just totally transform it and with a movie like this, we were just like really embracing that. Like, let's, let's let the music like do a lot of the heavy lifting. Let, you know, these movies were inspired by, we saw as kids in the eighties, they had these huge scores that would take you on a journey and would, you know, it, you know, emotional cues like, okay, this is the emotional part of the score. This is like the scary part of the score. Like, why not? You know, we're making a fantasy adventure film. Let's, let's lean into that and, you know, embrace that. So Dan really understood that. And, yeah, he would like take apart the scenes and characters and, you know, he would send us the, the, the cues and there would be these huge 
explanations of what he was going for. And it was just, it was so nice to like be collaborating with, with someone who was bringing their own ideas and, and just understood what we were doing and was really just kind of like enhancing that. So yeah, it was, it was a dream. Fabulous. Uh, Christopher, how about you and the, uh, the score and soundscape and soundtrack to Worm? Uh, yeah, I mean, the composer, David Bowman, and I were actually both from Seattle. Um, we grew up playing in bands, pretty bad uh, bands together, um, like back in the day. And one of the nice things about that is uh, that it, if you can give each other feedback on like the bad songs that you're writing when you're 14 or 15, you can definitely give each other feedback on like the movie you're making when you're 30, because nothing's more painful than having your best friend tell you that your song that you wrote about the girl you love is terrible. Um, so when we were writing this movie, um, David and I work really closely in the script writing process. So like I'll send him the script, he'll start composing based on scenes. And like some of the main themes that you hear in the movie, he wrote when I had written the draft of the script because it helps me write. And then we knew we wanted to have a bunch of needle drops in the movie of like pop songs, like Depeche Mode, Tears for Fears, like that style. And we had no money, like our total music budget was about, I think David lost music on the budget, on the, on the, on the music, because he was like paying all the musicians and stuff. I don't think he made anything. Um, and so he wrote all these like amazing pop songs. So he wrote, they're on Spotify. If you want, you can search Worm, David Bowman. They're, they're great. And he just like wrote all these different tones and I would just keep giving him different. And I was so mad at him because I was like, where were these great songs when we were in a high school band and like really needed good music to be popular. Um, but no, it was, we wanted everything to be completely unique to the world. And so it was like a lot of weird synthetic instruments, um, samples, a lot of like weird computer sounds sampled into things. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest learning experiences that we had in, in scoring the film and, and Kentucky and Albert, I'm sure you felt this, like, it was like, there was, a, I felt a lot of temptation. Like I would get us, I would get a scene to 25% and I'd be like, Ooh, I need the music to, you know, save it now. And I would send it to David. And um, one of the big things that we learned was about using music for comedic purposes. And there can be a lightness to music that can help, a, you know, a scene move forward. Um, and that's a lot of what we ended up doing in the end. Uh, and then with the sound design, it was just about keeping it simple and giving it the analog sounds of the eighties and nineties. And, um, a lot of those old dial up and rotary, you know, tactile quality of phones and clicks and buttons and before things were all touch screens and silent swiping. Uh, Anna, how about you? Um, I'd like to know more about how you worked with your sound people to build the dog who wouldn't be quiet, which is a, a very special and very unique and strange and wonderful film. Thank you. Uh, well, in in the case of my film, I have a very strong story because the 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 music of the film was composed by a very a very very close friend who died, um, and uh, I don't know. It's really because, for example, when I released the film this year in in Sundance Film Festival, uh, I had a lot of um ask askings for interviews to him because the music is great and the the very the very emotional part of the story is that when i was shooting the previous film the 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 film before this one uh, uh he was already sick and um i was shooting the the other film and uh, I some sometimes I I have um, callings from the shooting and I I try I was trying to explain him how I imagined the film and uh, he composed the 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 music imagining because of our our chats or our, our calls during the that period of time. And if you hear the music, it's really perfect for the film. And I like a lot the music that uh, doesn't underline the film, uh, uh, but, but um, has a dialogue with the images. 
uh, and sometimes maybe I like the music that is a contradiction uh, in terms of images, meanings. And I like that, uh, that complex idea of music and images working together, like a dialogue which is not always clear. Um, I, I liked the lot that experience in spite of being so sad and I feel that it was a big, big learning uh, to me understand that um, our process of crea creative process are always uh, a hearing process to hear a, a partner, uh, a person who is there, it's is something that is great and it's an opportunity that uh, we have when we make films, isn't it? It's something that is really special, like working with actors to hear is something that is not so usual uh, in normal life, I don't know. So I, I liked and it was very important to me, yeah. And I guess same question for, for you, Lee, because um, the first thing I noticed with the Pink Cloud was your first scene is very aggressively musical, and it really sets the tone of fear, um, and it really carries through even the silent scenes. How Obviously, that's all intentional, but how did you come to that decision to start the film off so strong? Yes, uh, it was very important that opening sequence because also we knew that we wouldn't be able to have a lot of clouds during the film so it's like let's really show this cloud in the beginning like how it's uh, appearing in the sky and how it gets bigger and bigger and it kills a girl right in the beginning and for the cloud uh, the um, uh, musician is Kai Wamon and you will also can hear all the soundtrack in Spotify if you put the pink cloud south soundtrack by Kai Wamon and and we talked a lot about the cloud because the music also uh, helped us creating the concept and the spirit and the mood of the cloud and of the film because we needed the team music to be uh, mysterious and scary and sad but also seductive and also like like it's like the cloud was calling Giovanna like it was almost saying, oh, maybe you should open the windows, let me get into your life, and I, I'm so beautiful, and my, my song is great. Um, so it was very important to have that creepy and, and mysterious vibe. And then we had a song that was very important. Uh, our reference for the song was Que Sera Sera by Doris Day. Uh, for the sequence, for our music sequence, when they try to be happy with the cloud. Uh, so it was that song brings a lot of irony to the situations like oh let's be happy in this absurd situation um and that song we also uh, like christopher said we couldn't buy many songs all the the songs are original and uh, but i was very happy then we created la vita i was like let's have this feeling of like the 50s and something that it doesn't look natural nowadays and it's like Giovanna trying to be this perfect wife like this 50s um, wife and so that's why we had the Que Sera Sera as our reference for this one and for the sound design we were always thinking well we couldn't add the normal sounds that we would add to the ambience like the traffic like the cars because there were no cars if someone was in the street that person would die um, so we had so much silence that even uh, on the sound, uh, on the mixing, I had to like, no, let's remove like the, this dog barking, this uh, crickets, uh, because we could hear everything. So we really had to pick on, now I have, like, even if it was a clock on the wall, like, tick, 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 we were like, no, maybe this scene for this scene is too much. So the silence was also very important. And after we had our own pink cloud, we are having still. So when we were in, in lockdown, we could feel that the streets were uh, silent. And we were like, well, we, we, we imagined that we would uh, be in silence. And we are now in our own lockdown. 
And and for those of you in the audience and in the panel who don't know, um, Pink Cloud was written way before the pandemic and shot before the pandemic. And the thing about the film is that it is eerily close to how our life is working out and it's um, the design of it. Everything comes together in this terrifying and emotionally resonant way. Um, and that kind of leads into a question we have from the audience. Um, how do you deal with being forced to compromise your vision due to budget restraints? Do you imagine your worlds with the budget in mind or do you shoot for the stars and then kind of bring it down to reality? I guess I'll jump in. I um, <clears throat> having had to like produce my own stuff for many years, I I do write with budget in mind and just try to be really creative as I write and not and you know only write stuff that I know I can pull off or I know I can visualize and practically execute in some way. Um, yeah, because otherwise I don't want disappointments later on. How about you guys, uh, Albert and Kentucker? Um, yeah, I, th I think so much of of the the vision of the film is um, is is embracing the low finess of it and the low budgetness of it. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine, like it, as we're as we're cooking up a new project, you know, thinking about a bigger budget. It's it's kind of hard to imagine um, going away from that style because I, I think we we love that lo-fi quality because it just because it just signifies a type of movie and a type of attitude about making a movie and 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 sort of like this this love of 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 making movies on your own and um, not needing to sort of buy into the system or the like the mainstream way of doing things. So um, I, I think I, I always respond to something that feels like you're, you're making a statement that says like, we don't have a lot of money here and that's gonna make the movie good because if we had a lot of money, we would have to compromise in all these ways or we have to make a, um, you know, make a movie that's gonna be marketable in this and that way. So um, Al, you take it from here. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. It's like, I don't think of it as a compromise. I think of it as like a, you know, a gift to be able to figure out how, like the creative way to do it all yourself. You know, there's always like a way you can do it, whether you're, you know, taking apart machines and hot gluing them to a bike helmet to make, you know, like there's creative and fun ways to make something that looks great that doesn't cost a lot. So um that's the fun part for me is like how to how to figure that out and so yeah it's like the budget maybe gets a little bit bigger maybe there'll be a little bit more but still to, to maintain that like the the diy you know building it up from the ground just what you can imagine and and collect and work together with your friends and uh you know that to me is the, the joy of filmmaking so i wouldn't want to go away from that you know as it got bigger so yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The yeah, more money, money you got. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Anna. Please. No, no. I, I, I was totally agree with with your words. I, I think that when you shoot with more questions than answers, you, you are close to be independent in in a way. And when you work with a big budget, you have other traps, but you always have traps that you work with and I don't know, I think that uh, from at least here in Argentina, we don't have su such a big subject, you know, su such a big uh, budget, sorry. Maybe you, you have money, maybe not, maybe I, I shot in Colombia, in, Bra in Brazil, but not, it's not like the big budget as maybe you can imagine or you can have a fantasy there in, in the state. So I can imagine that it, the, the idea of budget is different because uh, for independent filmmakers, you always try to do your film. So it's, it's maybe it's a little different to, to imagine yourself there maybe. 
Yeah, I think in the U.S., like the more money you get, the more people you have to answer to, the more yeah. Yeah. compromises you have to make on on what you're trying to say. It might look better, but you're gonna pay for it in one way or another. Um, and I like like what you were what Ken Tucker and Al were saying. I think when you make your movie in the first five minutes, you're kind of making an agreement with the audience. And I think if you embrace the lo-fi aesthetic, the handmade quality, it's actually a really bold statement. Because what you're basically saying is like, I don't know, if a high budget film is a really sophisticated card trick where they can't see the sleight of hand, a low budget film is, look, I'm going to fumble this and you're still going to love it. Like that's how confident it is. And that's why I find that aesthetic even that more like that much more engaging when it works because it's actually like it all works so well that I don't see the puppeteering you know what I mean anymore even though it's right in front of me it means the magic of the storytelling has done what the VFX would have had to do um and so and so but but in terms of process like I know when I write I would rather edit myself going into sh shooting because we've had to figure out a different way of doing something then edit it in the script before, you know what I mean, getting into that part of the process. I'd rather write the crazy, you know, version of whatever bad movie I'm working on right now, where like, you know, it's a pyramid scheme of vampires taking over an entire town and like, I'll figure out how to play that, you know, pay for that later and, or scale it down, you know, once it gets to the production conversations. And uh, we're, we're wrapping up here, but I have one final question, and it could be as, the answers could be as quick as one word, um, but uh, what current films, series, or filmmakers, or world builders excite you? This is a question from our audience. Uh, currently, like, what's the stuff you love that's coming out right now? Well, everybody that hasn't seen the other people's movies on here should watch them, because it's like, the really exciting stuff and all of these films. I'm so excited. I know The Pink Cloud, um, Starry Mansion, Potato, obviously, I think you premiered at South by, but these are a lot of great films that premiered at amazing festivals and it's such a cool opportunity to get to see them through SIF. So watch these. Um, and that's all I'll say because I can't think of anything else I've blanked. I saw Minari in the theater. I love that. Um, maybe it's because I just went back to the theater for the first time, but I don't think so. I, I think it was just a really beautiful, sweet movie. And I reson it resonated with me a lot. Um, I was, uh, uh, Anna was at Sundance as well. We were in the same uh, uh, competition. And uh, I'm always uh, happy to see work uh, directed and, and written by women. Uh, and I think now in, in Brazil we have a new generation that it's very exciting. Uh, we had also in our competition El Planeta and Hive that were directed by women. And I was very excited when I saw that Anna had a movie because I, I loved her film uh, Amiga no Parque. How it is in English? Yes, my friend from the park. My yes. friend from the park. I was like, oh my god, this director is is going to be in the in the same competition. So it was very exciting. <laughs> Thank you. And some of the, they, they asked for TV series, like my favorite TV series uh, of last year was I May Destroy You, that was also directed by, by a very talented woman. So yeah, of course, you guys are great as well, but it's very exciting to, to see a lot of new female directors. I, I'd love to see your films, but I think that from here I can't see because uh, because they are jail block, blocked or uh, some. So I don't know how to. I need the pandemic tops. I need. <laughs> but yes, I don't know. I I I watch a lot of things. I read a lot because I'm here. So of course. I, I imagine everybody is cooking and watching and reading all the time. And uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of little scenes and uh, interpretations. So maybe it's made ridiculous to say that film or that because I don't know what to say. I, 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 a lot of things. And finally, Wes, how about you? What's inspiring you nowadays? 
I have to say I've been super into um, this indie label, Blu-ray DVD label called Vinegar Syndrome. Uh, and I've just been so obsessed with them. I don't know if I should be inspired by them because there are a lot of them are horrible movies, but they're like horrible 80s um, and 70s exploitation horror, um, you know, mostly horror exploitation kind of stuff. And I just, they really um, let me, uh, <laughs> I mean, the past year, I feel like I wouldn't have survived without them. So I'm just a huge fan and I recommend to everybody to discover um, crazy treasures that they put out every month. Uh, Vinegar Syndrome is wonderful. They are run by uh, Brad Henderson. He is their curator and you can find him on Twitter and he's very open to discussion. Uh, VinegarSyndrome.com. I met him at Fantastic Fest and he, once you buy one of his Blu-rays in person, he will know you forever. He's the coolest guy. So please, by all means, check out these very bizarre exploitation films. Um, I think that about wraps it up. So um, all of your films are now playing through April 18th. So that's The Pink Cloud, Strawberry Mansion, Potato Dreams of America, Worm, and The Dog Who Wouldn't Be Quiet. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being part of the Seattle International Film Festival. These are all incredible films. I had a great time talking to you. So uh, say goodbye, and they'll, they'll cut us off when, when we're done. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Great to meet you guys. Congrats on all your films.